We'll welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And, of course, uh, some smart talk radio uh, is in your and our future. Uh, today, an interesting subject, one that we have not covered much uh, in the history of this show, uh, of all things. Franklin Roosevelt, we're going to be talking to Stanley Weintraub, uh, a prolific uh, author, historian, award-winning author of more than 50 acclaimed books, uh, ranging from the subjects of Pearl Harbor uh, to FDR and so on, National Book Award finalist, former Guggenheim Fellow, uh, and three-time recipient of the Distinguished Humanist Award from the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. Uh, We are very happy to have him. The work we're talking about today... uh, uh, brand new, called Young Mr. Roosevelt, FDR's Introduction to War, Politics, and Life, uh, a big subject indeed. Stanley, how are you, my friend? Okay, you're very good right now. Good. Uh, th- thank you for being with us. Uh, a lot has been written, obviously, about FDR. His life has been sort of dissected. Uh, very curious. Uh, from your point of view, because uh, you've written so much, uh, why does FDR capture our imagination so much? Of course, no other president has ever been elected to four terms, let alone three terms. <laughs> so uh, Roosevelt uh, holds the the record for uh, presidential longevity uh, and for his his experience in in battling two the uh, two major crises in his time. Uh, first, the Great Depression of 1929 to the mid 30s, uh, and then, of course, World War II. No, no one else has tackled such uh, catastrophic events as president. There seems to be, uh, and and you're just you're just the person to do this. Set us straight as to let's even in front of the young Mister Roosevelt years, war, politics, and life. Uh, take us back to him as a child and tell us about his general background and his frame of view as he entered manhood. Uh, as a child, I think the uh, the most interesting. Uh, experience he had uh, was when he was four or five years old, his father, uh, who was a uh, contributor to the Democratic Party in New York State, uh, took him to visit uh, Grover Cleveland, who had been the first Democratic president since the Civil War. And uh, Cleveland said, I have one wish for you, little man, that you'll never be president of the United States. Okay. Uh, in other words, this is not not a job that is fun. <laughs> it's a job that's full of problems. And Roosevelt didn't need it. That is, young Franklin didn't need it. He uh, he was born to a wealthy patrician family that lived uh, in the Hudson Valley of New York State. He could look forward to an untroubled future as a country squire. Uh, he might interrupt his moneyed leisure with golfing, boating, gentlemen's clubs, cocktails, cards connoisseurship and oversight of family properties, and if he really wanted to do some work, he could get himself a, an uninteresting job in a prestigious law firm. Uh, that wasn't much to look forward to, uh, so he realized, and he decided he wanted something more. And so he entered politics, which he thought he'd be doing in a small way. Uh, he wanted to first run for the House of Representatives in New York State. Uh, and there was no position available, uh, but there was one in the New York State Senate, and he was guaranteed to lose, but the Democratic Party felt, after all, he's uh, got a magic name, Roosevelt. Uh, his uh, Uncle Ted had just been president for two terms. Uh, why not let him do it? Uh, with his family money, he could pay for the campaign, uh, and so he campaigned for senator, and he won. And so that began his political career. When he ran a second time for the Senate, uh, it was just at the period of the election of Woodrow Wilson to the presidency, the next Democratic president after Grover Cleveland. And uh, Wilson wasn't really very interested in filling minor posts in the cabinet, uh, but one of his uh, pals uh, a newspaper publisher from North Carolina, uh, Josephus Daniels, was made Secretary of the Navy, somebody who uh, had really no experience with boats of the sea, and he was looking for an assistant secretary and thought of somebody he had met at the Democratic National Convention, a young man named Franklin Roosevelt, who loved sailing and boating and uh, 
knew something about the sea. Besides, as I said, his magic name was Roosevelt. Uh, and so he was nominated as uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and uh, that began uh, a trajectory uh, toward the presidency. In fact, Josephus Daniels uh, and uh, Franklin had a picture taken on the balcony of their Navy Department uh, offices uh, looking out toward the White House. And uh, why are you smiling, said uh, Daniels to Roosevelt. Uh, are you thinking that you're going to live in that house next? That is the White House. Uh, and, of course, that is what was going to happen. As you described, the Roosevelt pedigree uh, is strong and well-documented. He came from a family of tremendous power, influence, money, et cetera. How much... Actually, the, the influence and money uh, was more on his wife's side. He married yeah. his first cousin, who was also a Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the uh, former president, was her uncle, uh, only a distant cousin to Franklin. And uh, the, the power was on that Republican side. And they looked on uh, on Franklin, uh, a Democrat, as somebody who was stealing the family name. <laughs> and the money. <laughs> what... Uh, uh... Stanley, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to, he is remembered for many, many things, uh, but I'm intrigued with, and I think you are as well, what shaped his view of the world, what shaped his view of the responsibility of government, uh, the role of government, uh, uh, and America's place in the world, and, and were there defining events, in your opinion, uh, for the young Mr. Roosevelt that, that came out later in life that we all know? Well, it turned out that when he uh, entered the sub-cabinet, uh, he wasn't supposed to have much responsibility. Uh, but Daniels, his boss, uh, didn't know much about the Navy, and uh, as a result, uh, a lot of responsibility and authority gravitated to young Franklin, who learned his way around the job. Uh, what appalled him at first uh, was that so many of uh, Wilson's uh, cabinet members uh, were naive about what was going on in the world outside. Uh, World War I began in, in mid-1914, uh, and as far as the uh, government was concerned, Wilson's government, they wanted nothing to do with it. After all, uh, we had two big oceans on each side of us. We didn't need an army. We didn't need a navy. We, uh, uh, we were defended by the oceans. Uh, Roosevelt understood that this was not really true, uh, especially since the Panama Canal had not yet been opened. It was under construction. And we had, in effect, two navies that were distant from each other, the Pacific Fleet and the Atlantic Fleet. The only way they could get together uh, was to go uh, around Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. Uh, therefore, they were isolated from each other. Uh, not only that, uh, in addition to isolationism, which was very, very powerful uh, in this country, uh, there were also a lot of problems that were brought by the Wilson administration. Uh, he was uh, he was a teetotaler, as was his Secretary of State, uh, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, the uh, Secretary of the Navy was a teetotaler, but he didn't want any drinking in the Navy. Uh, and more than that, Woodrow Wilson came from Virginia originally, although he had been president of Princeton, and uh, he was a confessed racist. He complained to the Roosevelt's that they had white servants when they came to Washington. Uh, Wilson resegregated Washington, D.C. Uh, that racism uh, disturbed Roosevelt as much as uh, isolationism uh, disturbed him. Uh, he had to fight his way against the uh, more powerful people in the cabinet uh, to get things accomplished, and uh, he did. Uh, he was able to rearm the Navy uh, and the Marines, the Marines were part of the Navy. Uh, eventually, when we were forced into the war, uh, Wilson wasn't happy about that, but we were a lot more ready than before. The Army wasn't nearly ready for war, but the Marines were, because the Marines were part of the Navy, and uh, Roosevelt had focused on keeping the Marines ready. Uh, the Marines became the primary fighting force when the Americans went to France in 1917 and 18. And Roosevelt came over there to uh, inspect them. He wanted to get in the war himself. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Uncle Ted, uh, said, Franklin, you've got to get into uniform. And Franklin wanted to get into uniform. 
but he realized that uh, he was needed in the Navy Department, and uh, Wilson objected to his leaving. Besides, uh, in a dose of realism, he understood that he might become the lieutenant commander in the Navy, which was about as high as he could get in uh, rank that he imposed on himself. Uh, but that wasn't going to get him anywhere. In other words, he wasn't going to be a leader. The way he was he was in Washington, he was a leader. And he was a leader in many different ways beyond uh, his secretaryship in the Navy. Uh, he once went to, uh, to the uh, town of Reading in Pennsylvania uh, to give a talk. Uh, and uh, in that talk, uh, of course, he was loyal to the administration publicly. Uh, he said... Uh, the administration believes that the national government should be conducted for the benefit of the 99%, not the 1%, as as administrations in the past have done. And so here, that term was born long before the 21st century. Roosevelt in 1914, uh, talking about inequality of income and uh, inequality in general. So... uh, no one attributes this to him, but uh, Franklin uh, seems to have coined that 99%, 1% image. Again, if you just joined us, uh, yours truly, Warner Lewis uh, from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. Got a good one going here talking to Stanley Weintraub. He is the probably the America's preeminent uh, historian uh, and, and so knowledgeable about uh, FDR. We're talking about a brand new war called Young Mr. Roosevelt, FDR's introduction to war politics and life. Uh, Stan... Uh, Let's jump forward here just a little bit. Imagine uh, FDR uh, comes back today, uh, sees what's going on in D.C., uh, squabbling, government shutdown, uh, debt ceiling uh, looming in front of us. Uh, His reaction would be what? I think he'd be appalled. Uh, This was not the kind of government that he knew about. Uh, uh, Government uh, seemed to be propelled by... uh, not only ideals, but uh, by uh, uh, pragmatism, by reality. There are things you had to do. Uh, Roosevelt wrote articles as an assistant secretary for various uh, magazines and newspapers uh, talking about the need for a strong Navy, uh, the need for, for uh, uh, economic reality, uh, equality of labor. Uh, he, he was the uh, man in the Navy Department in charge of Navy Yards, which meant that he was able to uh, to lead the buildup uh, of our armed forces. There was never any question about it. Uh, he would go to Congress and uh, talk to influential people there on both parties, uh, and he's very persuasive, and he got his way. Uh, the two parties were not as, uh, uh, as distant as they seemed to have become in the last uh, generation, and things could get done. Uh, sometimes you got things done by uh, trading favors. Uh, there was one case where, uh, in, in a cabinet meeting, the Secretary of the Navy uh, wanted something done, and uh, the Secretary in another department said, uh, uh, I want a job for my brother. If you, have, if you can give my brother a job in your department, I'll, I'll take care of what you want. And uh, this sort of thing, the horse trading went on uh, quietly, but it went on. Uh, today, there seems to be no horse trading. Uh, people are just too rigid. Well, the FDR, uh, whether you uh, this is your political leanings or not, obviously was a proponent of a very powerful and influential federal government. And I'm curious, from your point of view, uh, was that a result? Was that a personal philosophical stance, or do you believe he was responding to the needs of the time? I, I think uh, the latter is correct. I think he was responding uh, to his time. He was learning as he went along. Uh, all he had been in New York State uh, was the chairman of a committee on agriculture uh, because he came from uh, a country district. Uh, he really didn't know much about other things, although he uh, sailed a boat and he knew a lot about the, uh, the seaman's life. Uh, he had to learn on the job. And he was very fortunate that uh, a, a crusty uh, middle-aged newspaper man named uh, Lewis McHenry Howe, uh, who needed a job, was available, and who became a campaign manager for him, 
when he ran for the Senate and then came to Washington to assist him in labor matters and other things in the uh, Navy Department. And uh, Lewis Howe stayed with him uh, loyally right through to his first election as president in 1932, 1933. Uh, he died in the first uh, term of Roosevelt's presidency. But you need people like that. Uh, and Roosevelt knew how to find them and was able to pick uh, potential comers uh, in the Navy and in the government otherwise. Uh, many of the leading figures in the American uh, military establishment in World War II were people that he knew and uh, plucked uh, early in his career. Uh, for example, uh, a young destroyer commander named uh, Bill Halsey, who became one of the leading admirals in the Pacific. Uh, William Leahy, uh, who became his chief of staff in the White House during World War II. Quite a number of people like that uh, were people he knew. Uh, and he, he was very good at uh, publicity and promotion, uh, making sure that people knew uh, what he was doing and why it was important to have it done. That's one of the reasons why he wanted to go to Europe and uh, visit the Marines and the Navy uh, and be able to come home and tell them uh, what they were doing. And in the process, uh, he was very inventive. He realized that the Navy was building battleships, <clears throat> but this was not a battleship war. It was a war fought on the ground in Europe. Uh, and so he uh, he found a way to use the the big cannon on battleships uh, by putting them on flat cars and sending them to the front, and uh, they became uh, part of our artillery uh, in France. It worked out very successfully. Uh, uh, he also developed uh, an idea about uh, planting mines in the North Sea and the English Channel to deter German submarines from getting into the Atlantic and sinking our ships. So he was a, he was a person who listened uh, sometimes to crazy ideas from inventors and separated the crazy ones from the good ones. Uh, and in Europe, uh, he was under fire for the first time uh, in his life, and he was excited by that. Uh, he also came over uh, to Europe at a time when the uh, big influenza epidemic uh, was... Uh, covering Europe, and thousands, even millions, were dying from influenza uh, when he came home on a troop ship uh, late in 1918. He was very ill, uh, and he had to be carried off the ship on a stretcher. And when his wife and uh, his mother carried him to his mother's apartment in New York City, they had to unpack his bags, and they found, among other things, a whole sheaf of love letters from somebody else, from his wife's social secretary. He had gotten involved with her. It nearly destroyed his career. Uh, they couldn't allow for scandal. <clears throat> they, they hushed it up. Uh, Eleanor offered him a divorce, and he couldn't accept the divorce because it would destroy his career. Uh, and uh, Eleanor... Uh, may have re also realized that Lucy Mercer, the other woman, uh, was a Roman Catholic and wouldn't have married a divorced man even if she slept with him. Uh, so there was no chance of that happening. The result was that uh, the marriage after that was correct and uh, Eleanor was loyal, uh, but it was not really a marriage uh, after World War One. You know, uh, FDR... Uh highly respected, but uh, as you just mentioned, uh, flawed for sure, and lots of detractors uh, from many different sects. Um, I'm curious as to it, going inside of his personality uh, as much as you can. Uh, you see a guy that is bright, uh, knowledgeable, as you said, learning on the job. Is there anything in particular about Roosevelt that, that we as Americans don't know and that we should know about his personality, maybe or his point of view? Uh, I think we don't realize uh, what a transition he made under pressure uh, and through experience in those first years in public life. Um, he had been a party-going, pleasure-loving guy. He was very handsome. Uh, the, the women uh, chased him. He had only one affair, uh, the affair with Lucy Mercer. But nevertheless, uh, he was considered to be a handsome playboy. 
but uh, that was a surface matter. Uh, he became much more than that. And uh, toward the end of the war, uh, people realized that the magic name of Roosevelt was not the only magic thing about him, uh, that he really uh, was a leader. Uh, he had good ideas. He uh, he spoke well, uh, uh, and he could travel and, uh, uh, and meet people and impress them. Uh, and as a result, uh, he became the uh, the uh, vice presidential nominee for the Democrats in 1920 after the war. The Democrats were not going to win. It was quite obvious that uh, they weren't they wouldn't win because Wilson was so unpopular at the end of the war. Uh, but this gave Roosevelt uh, a platform. He traveled from coast to coast. Uh, uh, the traveling then was done by train and. You uh, spoke from the rear platform of the train at various um, stations. Uh, He became very well known. And uh, he was not even 40 at this point. He had become Assistant Secretary of the Navy at age 31. uh, And in 1920, uh, he was uh, still a relatively young man. Uh, He lost, but he lost uh, uh, and remained a major public figure. Uh, it's after the period of my book, just a year later, uh, that he would uh, get polio and become uh, a cripple, lo- losing his, the use of his legs in 1921. But that did not stop him. <clears throat> uh, obviously, he he persevered. Uh, he went back into politics again. Uh, people did not know that he had lost the use of his legs. He was very clever uh, about... Uh, Manipulating himself, uh, he would be held under each arm by someone, and uh, it looked as if he were striding to the speaker stand when he spoke. Many people are surprised still uh, when they go to the Roosevelt Memorial uh, in Washington, D.C., and see as they enter a statue of Roosevelt sitting in a wheelchair. Sitting in a wheelchair, that was his home. Uh, In the White House later, he used an ordinary kitchen chair and put wheels on it. Uh, he didn't want to be in a wheelchair that looked like he was a sick man. Uh, he knew how to project an image of strength and of character, and he was uh, very successful at that. Interesting at the uh, uh, some of the information that we have that, that later uh, on a voter registration, he would identify himself simply as a tree farmer. I, th- I thought that was an interesting twist. Well, the, the, uh, the facts about Roosevelt that people don't know uh, are are sometimes uh, surprising to them, uh, as I mentioned with the the wheelchair. Uh, there was never a picture published um, of Roosevelt in a wheelchair uh, during his lifetime. Uh, I think that's amazing. Uh, the press was very different then. Uh, the press during World War One and uh, thereafter uh, might have been hungry for gossip, uh, but public figures were generally insulated from really serious gossip, uh, including the president, President Wilson. Wilson was involved with uh, another woman when his first wife was dying. Uh, he didn't marry her, but he uh, uh, he married somebody else, a, a widow, uh, who uh, he fell for shortly after that. And uh, there were jokes around Washington. What do you think the new Mrs. Wilson did when when Wilson proposed to her. And the answer was, uh, she fell out of bed. (laughs) And that would have made the newspapers now. Yep, indeed. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time here, but uh, the subject uh, is one that that is still talked about uh, decades later, a fascinating uh, life indeed, and and well-documented here. The The young Mr. Roosevelt, FDR's introduction to war, politics, and life, by uh, noted historian Stanley Weitraub. Uh, Stanley, thank you so much for your time. And how can people uh, find out more about your work and maybe get pick up a copy of the book? Well, of course, uh, the the, the Capo Press publishes the book. It should be next week uh, uh, in in bookstores, uh, and of course they can buy it online as well. And if they want to find out more about me, they can look me up online. I'm there, and I've uh, published a lot of books. All right, listen again. Thank you so much for your time and. Uh, 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 and spending uh, some time with us today sharing uh, insights into this remarkable uh, person and former president, obviously. We'd love to have you back on again. 
Well, I hope so next year. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. 